right. Good morning, everybody. And we want to say good morning to those watching us online, um, those of you who are incarcerated or wherever you might be, uh, we want to say hello to you online, okay? And anyway, we are in lesson number eight. Would you turn to lesson eight, which is wisdom for, Heze for Hezekiah's court? And we're going to talk about Hezekiah before we begin with the chapters. Everybody there? Lesson number eight. Come on, let's go. Chop, chop. Boy, I tell you. Let us read the hymn. Uh, why don't you guys start with verses 1 and 2. We're all, by the way, we're all going to stand when we come to verse 5 because it's a, a doxology, okay? All right, so we don't have to stand now. Go ahead, everybody. Hark the glad celestial hymn, angel choirs above are raising, cherubim and seraphim, and increasing chorus praising. Fill the heavens with sweet accord, holy, holy, holy Lord. Let me read verse 3. Lo, the apostolic train, join your sacred name to hollow. Prophets swell the glad refrain, and the white-robed martyrs follow. And from noon, from morn to set of sun, through the church, the song goes on. Everybody, you are king of glory, Christ, son of God, yet born of Mary. For a sinner's sacrifice, as to death a tributary, first to break the bars of death, you have opened heaven. Let's stand, please. Can we sing it? Uh, I don't know. Let's just not do it. Because Daryl, because Daryl can't, he can't hit the notes. Together, please. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit, three we name you. Though in essence only one, undivided God we claim you. And adoring, bend the knee while we own the mystery. And let's pray together. O oh God, you resist the proud and give grace to the humble. It's true humility modeled on the humility of your own son. Then we may never be puffed up and provoke your wrath. In all lowliness, let us partake of the gifts of your grace. All this we pray through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. And open up your Bibles to 2 Kings, chapter 16. Yeah, 2 Kings. We're going to start with this, question number one, or day one. Well, it's on page 598 in my Bible, but uh, yeah, in front. Help her out over there, Erica. Page uh, 598, Miss Joan. Joan, it's page 598. 598. All right, so uh, question one is, the writer of 2 Kings describes the king of Ahaz in Judah, all right? So based on 2 Kings chapter 16, summarize what the king of Judah was doing at this time. So let me read. Verse six, chapter 16, verse 1. In the 17th year of Pekah, son of Ramaliah, Ahaz, son of Jotham, king of Judah, began to reign. Ahaz was 20 years old when he became king. He ruled in Jerusalem 16 years. Unlike David, his father, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord his God. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Remember, that was the northern group and even sacrificed his son in the fire. Imagine that. Following the detestable ways of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. Just imagine, folks, that was their worship life, sacrificing children. 
He offered sacrifices and burned, burned incense at the high places on the hilltops and under every spreading tree. Everybody understand that? So high on the hills and under the tree. All right? So he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Okay? Everybody got that? All right. Now let's go to chapter 17. Chapter 17, verse 6 and 7. All right? This is the devastation. 17, verse 6. I got to find it. In the ninth year of Hosea, the king of Assyria, the, Hosea, the king of Assyria, captured Samaria and deported the Israelites to Assyria. He settled them in Hala, in Gozan, on the Habor River, and in the towns of the Medes. All this took place, verse 7, everybody there? Because the Israelites had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of Egypt, from under the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And here's the phase. They worshipped other gods and followed the practices of the nations. The Lord had driven them out. Before them, yes. Okay, had driven out. So they sinned against the Lord, okay? Now, I want to go to one more thing. Go to chapter 18. You can, we're going to go on to question number three. In 715, Hezekiah succeeded his father Ahaz. Remember Ahaz? He's the guy that sacrificed his son. How was Hezekiah's reign different from his father? I'm in chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. Everybody there? In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abijah, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, as his father David did. He removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, cut down the Asherah poles. You know what the Asherah poles, they were wooden poles, that they had markings on and they worshiped the gods through there. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses made. For up to that time, the Israelites had been burning incense to it. Imagine that. Talk about paganism, huh? Verse, uh, where are we? Five. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after him. He held fast to the Lord, did not cease to follow him. He kept the commands the Lord gave Moses, and the Lord was with him. He was successful in whatever he undertook. He rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. From watchtower to fortified city, he defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory. All right? Now you can go to... Proverbs chapter 25. That just gives us a, set, a setting, a background, okay? Everybody there? You all right, Erica? All right. So we are in Proverbs chat. We're going to do uh, five, 25, 26, 27, 28, and 29 today, all right? So we're not going to read a lot of it. That's why you have to do it ahead of time. So look at verse 1. Let's read it together. These are more Proverbs of Solomon, copied by the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah. So no, let's just stop there. So what, what does this mean? What did Hezekiah do? Well, yeah, but what does it mean here in verse, huh? He found some more Proverbs from Solomon. And this is 270 years after Solomon died. Yeah, isn't that something? So Hezekiah, the one who honored the Lord, found these. So what did he do? He got some men. We're not sure who they were. I think I have a note here. Pro professional court scribes or something like that. And they wrote it down 
um, these Sol Solomonic Proverbs, okay? And by the way, there are two different collections. At least that's what my sources say. Verse, chapters 25, 26, and 27 seem to go together. And then chapters 28 and 29. All right, everybody there? All right, so chapter 25, beginning with verse 2, all the way to the end, verse 27. Is that how far it goes? Well, 20, close, close enough. Seems to be, has a unity. And it's called a proverb poem, all right? And uh, it, it's, it, it, there's a lot of, there's admonitions here. Look at verse 6. Uh, humble yourself. Uh, if you look at that for a moment, do not exalt yourself in the king's presence. And do not claim a place among great men. In other words, let other people do that for you, okay? It's better for him to say what? Come up here than to, for him to humiliate you before, uh, before the others, all right? Uh, let's see. Uh, so, court wisdom. Wisdom in avoiding the court. Look at verses 7 to 10. Here we are told to resolve our disputes privately, if you want to write that down. And let me suggest that you do that. Resolve your disputes privately. When you have a dispute with someone, either in the church or the neighbor or somebody, try and do it personally, okay? Try not to involve everybody else. And if sometimes that's not going to work, right? So uh, in the New Testament, we are told what's the process. Face to face, then one or two, yeah, take a friend, and then others, all right? But it's much better to resolve conflict. By the way, I am no longer going to be a reconciler. I was a re Remember, I was a reconciler for a year. I haven't been on a case in years. But I, was, I, I just don't want to travel. I mean, I, it's, you know, that can be anywhere, 50 miles. I, I could go to travel, yeah. I could, I could tra like I traveled to Philadelphia. But, you know, by the time we got in, finally, and I remember doing this, and I would, I would set, you know, you had the two parties, and I wasn't alone always. I always took somebody with me. I had, like, three people who I trusted that I would take, or two or three. And I remember many times after, and no, after, you know, they gave their spiel and we're sitting there. I'd say, well, we're going to take a break, and Bill, I would like to see you. So I take Bill. I never took these people by myself. I always would take one of my people. And we go in a private room. And there were numerous times I would say something to this effect. You know, you're really being a jerk. This is unnecessary. You've taken this thing too far. You need to apologize. You need to let it go. And let's resolve this. And you know what happened? It usually worked. Okay? Because now, you know, he had, the person had their voice before another council. But finally, you just have to kind of say to someone, you know, give it up, man. You're being a pain in the, in the art. You know, you're, did I say that? You're being a pain. So stop it. Now, you can't always do that. But a lot of times, that's what it is, isn't it? Huh? By the way, it, the good news is, or the, the important thing is, you have to learn to say that. All right, I wasn't thinking of that. <laughs> you have to learn to say that to yourself. You have to learn to say that to yourself. That you've just take you're being a jerk. You've taken it too far. Correct? It's always helpful. All right, let's go on. Uh, let's go to verses 21 and 22. Let me read 21 and 22. Where are we? If your enemy is hungry, oh, this is a good one, give him food to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. 
In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. All right, let's talk about that. So how do you deal with people you don't like? <laughs> oh, well, I have a list here. I have a list here. So feed, feed your enemy instead of seeking revenge, all right? Um, how do we deal with people we don't like? Well, probably the easiest way is ignore them, correct? Uh, number two, what's the second one? Oh, that's nice. Good, good. That's a good one. Talk to others about them. Well, yeah, but that's what we do, right? We talk to others. That's gossip. Yeah, yes, come on, people. We're not that pious. All right, we ignore them. We talk to others about them. That, you know, that Daryl, Daryl, Daryl Shavinsky, you know, he just drives me nuts. Anyway, or here's a third one. We pretend to be nice. We face-to-face, we're nice. But then we walk away and we just curse their name, okay? So, uh, here's the deal. Feed your enemy instead of seeking revenge. Melt him with... How many of you have tried this? Okay. And did it work? Anybody else? You say yes, right, Sue? Sue? Really? In your heart. Yes. Oh, good. Anybody else? Yeah. I was going to say, in the family, you know, when you're being married, you get you get red at it that you don't know. You come up with this company spin, but the family is practicing and the holiday, we all got together, get together without the cheating, without the smiles that you have. I, I can't it's kind of like the daughter-in-law you don't like. You wish your son would have married another girl. Yeah. Right? Anybody ever have that? I had a conversation with someone on that recently. I can't remember who that was. But anyway, that's bad, isn't it? Yeah. Where the mother-in-law says, by the way, I wish you would have married so-and-so. Man. Feed your enemy instead of seeking your vengeance. All right? Heap burning coals. And you change his attitude, causing shame and remorse and a change of heart. All right? The Lord rewards, here's this other part, the Lord rewards those who show such magnanimity. All right? The Lord rewards those who show that magnanimity. By the way, what's the gospel in this? This is how exactly God deals with us. God doesn't like you personally. He doesn't like me. But God, we are spiritually blind, dead, and enemies of God. But God in his grace and mercy receives and accepts us through his son, Jesus Christ. Think about that, people. By nature, you and I are spiritually blind, dead, and Enemies of God, the Bible says. Think about that. Whoa. And it is only because of grace and mercy and forgiveness that he likes us. And he's willing to work on us. That, that's an amazing thing. All right? And please don't think to yourself, well, he certainly should like me. I'm a wonderful person. Love your enemy and pray for them. All right, let's go to chapter 26. All right, chapter 26 is the nature of the fool and the lazy man. Basically, we got the fool here, and then we got the, the sluggard. Don't you love the sluggard? All right, let's, let's uh, discussion on the fool, verses 1 through 12. Let me begin with verse 3. We're in 26, right? A whip for the horse a halter for the donkey, and a rod for the back of fools. (laughs) Well, Solomon must have had a tough day that way, huh? 
Do not answer a fool. Notice, you could, I got, by the way, I got the fool. Notice all the times fool is mentioned. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten times you got the word fool. Let me go on. Answer a fool according to his folly, and he will be wise in his own eyes. Now think about that. You know what that means? So if a foolish person is saying something stupid and you say, oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, I, you know, that's great. He will be what? He will be wise in his own eyes. He'll say, yeah, I guess I am right. Oh, okay. Like verse 6, like cutting off one's feet. <laughs> ah, like cutting off one's feet or drinking violence is the sending of a message by the hand of a fool. Ah, like a, you know, I think about that in Washington, D.C., sending a fool to Russia. All right, let's go on. Like a lame man's legs that hang limp is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. Think about that. It means nothing, right? It, there, it doesn't work. It do, in other words, it, his legs don't work and the proverb doesn't work. Everybody get that? Like a stone in a sling is the giving of honor to a fool. Like a stone in a sling. What does that mean? It's, it's out there, I think. It's just out there, right? I mean, if you're good at slinging a stone, you can direct it, but it's, it's out there. Not sure what that means. Like a thorn bush in a drunkard's hand. Oh my gosh. Uh, think about that. A thorn bush. Have you ever had a thorn bush in, a, in your hand? That is not easy, is it? But thorn bush in a drunkard's hand is a proverb in the mouth of a fool. What does that mean? A thorn bush in a drunk. So if you're drunk, maybe the thorn bush doesn't hurt. So if you're a fool and you've got a proverb in your mouth, in your mouth you got a fool, you don't, you don't know what it is. You don't realize it, right? I don't know, odd stuff, isn't it? All right. Like an archer. Notice all, look at all the likes. Like a cutting, like, like, like. Like an archer who wounds at random is he who hires a fool or any passerby. As a dog returns, <laughs> you know, as a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. Isn't that something? Do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Huh? Have you met? I think I met someone recently who believes he is very wise in his own eyes knows things, and is very secure in that knowledge. I don't have time. I don't have Yeah, and I don't have time for this. I don't have time for this. If, you know, I, I'm going to leave. Yeah, busy. Yeah. All right, anybody want to say anything? Uh, the nature of the fool. All right, let's go to verses 13 to 16. Uh, this is the sluggard. Don't you love these things? The sluggard says, there is a lion on the road, a fierce lion roaming the streets. As a door turns on its hinges, so a sluggard turns in his bed. The sluggard buries his hand in the dish, but he's too lazy to bring it back to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who answer discreetly. All right, let's just stop there. Look at there's four, four uh, saying or three. Are there saying three, three, four, four? All right. So what do we find here about the sluggard? He will use any excuse not to go to work, like. There's a lion on the road, roaming the streets. What does that sound like, people? There's COVID out there. Yes, 
Didn't we talk about that last week? Yeah, there's COVID. It's true. Living in fear. By the way, I found something from Ben Franklin who said, and I, I'm not quoting it, but something to the effect that if you give up your freedoms for safety, you're in danger. Didn't anybody remember that? That was a quote that was around four years ago when, or three years ago when COVID started, that it's dangerous to give up your freedoms for safety. And, and now we're learning that, yeah. 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 And, we're, and you know, we're slow learners. We should have known that ahead of time. I think hopefully we're wiser now. Yeah. But anyway, think about that. The door, and look at ver verse 14. The door merely swings on its hinges, and it leads to nowhere. Nowhere. Yeah, it leads to nowhere. Uh, verse seven, 16, can't even feed himself to live. All right? This is also the danger of the laziness of faith. Think about that being the sluggard in faith, where you're so lazy and you don't care, you make every excuse in the book not to go to church, not to be concerned about spiritual things, not to, not, not to do God's word, not to support anything. No, I, I'm not, no, I'm, I'm too. And you know, I say, hate to say it, and those who may be watching, maybe you're different, but the world out there, those folks still have not reconnected with the kingdom of God. Sad, four years later. And no, I wonder if they ever will. All right, let's go on. Um, verses 18 and 19 is the danger of the practical joker. Let's go to verses 23. This is on deceitful speech, 23. Everybody with me? Like a coating of glaze over earthenware, our fervent lips with an evil heart. Wow. You understand that imagery? A coating of glaze over earthenware. In other words, it's just a thin coating. It's not real. It's flattery. flattery, yeah. A malicious man disguises himself with his lips, but in his heart he harbors deceit. They have many politicians You think? Though his speech is charming, do not believe him, for seven ab abominations fill his heart. Are you notice something here? What, do you, what word are you noticing? Oh, no. What word are you noticing? Oh, come on. Heart. The heart. The heart is who the person is. That's his innermost being. Okay, that's his, yeah, his character, not his heart in the, the, the pumping thing. Evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, yeah. And then 20, 20, oh, we did, okay. So, coating of glaze, let me read what I got on this. Deceitful speech. You know there are 150 references to speech in the Proverbs, book of Proverbs, 150, Okay. The heart, three times you have the heart, an evil, evil disposition, an evil inner disposition, okay? Glaze is covering up speech. By the way, speech can hide a lot of evil, can it? Uh, 24 to 25, hypocritical speech, the fine art of listening, I have as a note. Hatred and a lying belong together. The tongue of the righteous, of, of righteousness, and then tongues, oh yeah, let's go to 27, what is it, 20, the next one. Let me read the next one, yeah. All right, I, I got, hang on. If a man digs a pit, a lying tongue hate the, hates those, who, who, those it hurts. Oh, at verse 28. And a flattering mouth works ruin. Okay? The fine art of rose. Why do I have that in here? Okay. I don't know. The tongues of righteousness bring 
are like choice silver. That must be from another place. They bring healing. So the tongue is important, right? All right, let's go on to chapter 27. Chapter 27 is planning for the future. All right? Uh, let's go to verses 1 and 2. Do not boast about tomorrow, for you don't know what a day may bring forth. Let another praise you and not your own mouth. Someone else and not your own lips. Let's go to do not boast about tomorrow. You don't know what a day may bring forth. What about that? Anybody? I have a quote here from Spurgeon. Remember Spurgeon? He's one of my favorite. Anybody remember Spurgeon? I can't remember you do, but anybody else? He was the preacher, the great preacher in England back in the 1800s, I think. Great preacher. I, I got his sermons on my shelf. He says this, a blessing, uh, a blessing we don't, oh, it is a blessing that we don't know what a day may bring. Be thankful for such ignorance. Isn't that something? So you don't, be thankful that you don't know all that the future holds. Yeah, and you can plan the best you can, right? But, and you should. But, so thank God you don't know everything that's going to happen. You know? Aren't you glad about that? I mean, aren't you glad you don't know you're going to have a major Alzheimer's in three years? Gregory? I'm going to have, I won't know how to get home. Just think about that. Not knowing how to get home. By the way, I have to get my driver's license renewed in January. And, yeah, I'm going to take the test online. My, I shouldn't put this out there, should I? But I mean, Debbie passed it. Marlene barely passed hers, right? <laughs> but anyway, imagine that. What if I, what if I can't drive? I'm, what am I going to do? I'm, I'm going to have to retire. Maybe I know what I'll do. I'll move over to the pantry and live there. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea, boy, I tell you. All right. Our mo well, let me read this. Our modern arrogance of progress. We, are over we have an overconfident attitude that we can control the future. Well, maybe that's dangerous. Uh, anyway, all right, let's go to verses 6, 6 and 9 and 10. What chapter are we in? 27. All right. Verse 6, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. What do you want to say about that? Wounds from a friend. So in other words, this is the person who says, you know, you're being a jerk. Honesty, yeah, honesty from a friend can be trusted, right? But it, the receiver the receiver has to be, the receiver of those words has to be receptive to those words. Just think if you remove everybody from your life who says anything negative about you or and only says what is good, that's dangerous, isn't it? Huh? See, it was good to have that sister or brother when you were a kid who told you how what a, what a louse you were. Huh? How bad you were. Let's go on to verses 9 and 10. Perfume. Okay, let's go on. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Do not force... Oh, let's go to verse, verse 9. No, let's do... Perfume and incense bring joy to the heart and the pleasantness of one's friend springs from his earnest counsel. Okay, those go together. Yeah, six and nine go together. Everybody got that? And do not forsake your friend and the friend of your father, and do not let go to your brother's house when disaster strikes, and do not go to your brother's house when disaster strikes you. Better a neighbor nearby than a brother far away. Let's talk about that. If you have good neighbors, but maybe it isn't always a good idea to go back to relatives. Yeah. Huh? This makes sense here. Do not fail a friend in need when in need you lie on friendship rather than on mere friendship. 
Oh, say that again. I mean, let me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repeat it, Suzanne. Go ahead. Do not fail a friend in need. All right, hang on. Do not fail a friend in need. When in need. When in need. Rely on friendship. Okay, hang on. When in need, rely on friendship rather than, rather than family, family members. Yeah. That's a good, good attitude. Yeah, that's probably good. Huh? Yeah. By the way, it's important to have friends as you become an adult, isn't it? Do you have friends? Yes? yes? No? Um, well, you know, it's not always easy to have friends, is it? When you don't work. Yeah, when you don't work, you lose your friends. Yes, that's right. The other thing is friends that you had, they, re they go out of your life, you know? I mean, I, by the way, I talked to Pastor R.Z. Meyer, and I hope I can say this, and I visited with him. He was on my mind for weeks, so I called him up this week. He's doing great. You know, he's only 96 years old. But he was with us uh, 20, almost back in the 90s. I looked up, his, his name came across something for the pantry. And he was with us back in the 90s. And he was a great blessing for me. I don't know if you guys realize that. He was a great blessing for this church. You know why? Well, he did, but he had his wisdom. And he had wisdom, and he, and he, and he also had a calming effect, but he also knew the folks from atonement because he had served at atonement for years. So he was a real blessing. Yeah, a real connection. Yeah, so it's important to have those. I, I think of other guys like uh, who's the other guy that moved out of the area? He used to he used to help out here. My my buddy, the black guy, preacher. What was his name? Yeah, no, no, he's down in uh, he's down Pastor Lucas. Yeah, uh, what was his first name? Glenn Glenn Lucas. Yes, he was a great great blessing to me too. Yeah. All right, let's move on. That's one of the problems. As you get older, you lose your friends, don't you? And you stop work, and you, um, yeah. Let's go to verses 17 and 20. Now I'm going to be in trouble because I mentioned this. All right, 17 to 20. What chapter are we in? 27. All right. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. He who tends a fig tree will eat its fruit. He who looks after his master will be honored. And verse, I'm going on to where? 20. As water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects the man. Death and destruction are never satisfied, and neither are the eyes of man. Okay, let's go through that. Uh, what verse? As iron sharpens iron, what's that? That's the bond of brotherhood, right? Constructive criticism. Right? As, a, as irons? Okay. Um, verse 20, where were we? Death and destruction. Hell and destruction are never satisfied. And neither are the eyes of man. What does that mean? Death and destruction would be evil. And neither are the eyes of, of men or people. Men. What does that mean? They want, more. they want more, yes. And that can be many things. It can be, the eyes can be lust. Lust for what? Money. Fame, Fame, sex, power, money, recognition, prestige. Okay? And who, who were the first examples of lust in the Bible? Adam and Eve. Oh, Adam and Eve. And well, David was sexual lust, but Adam and Eve. Well, it, the fruit was good to eat. It will make us why? why, knowing the difference between good and evil, and so they ate it. By the way, a lot of things go back. By, I'm preaching. Oh, by the way, Sunday we're celebrating the pantry, and one of the phrases you never think about in caring for those in need is one of the Bible verses you never think about. Genesis chapter 3, Cain says to the Lord, am I my brother's keeper? 
And the answer is, of course you are. <laughs> yeah. Think, think about that. These things always go back to the very beginning of our sinful nature from our parents. Okay? Am I my brother's keeper? Yeah. I'm pre By the way, it's fun to preach on this. There are two, over 200 and some references to helping the poor in the Bible. It's huge. I, 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 and I don't know what to pick for a text. I have my, I, my, I've done my work, and there are so many. And Jesus, Jesus talks a lot about the poor, and he calls the poor in spirit. Now, that's a different poor. What is the poor in spirit as opposed to physically poor? Those are the ones who are, have a, a spirit who are, see their need, and they need a Savior. Everybody got that? The poor in spirit as opposed to those who are wealthy or not wealthy monetarily, but they have everything they want. They don't need the Savior. Yeah. Yeah. And then the gospel lesson is from Matthew where Jesus divides the folks and he says, and they say, well, we never helped anybody. Or when did we see anybody in need? And Jesus says, when you never did. That's what, you know, anyway. All right, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's move on. Where are we? 20. Let's go to verses um, 23 to 27. 23, verse 23. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds, for riches do not endure forever. And a crown is not secure for all generations. Boy, that's true. When the hay is removed and new growth appears and the grass from the hills is gathered in, the lambs will provide you with clothing, the goats with the price of the field. And you will have plenty of goat's milk to feed you and your family and to nourish your servant girls. What is this? Oh, come on. Got to get by. I got a footnote 23 to 27. The gall goes together. No, taking care of business. Take care. Of, this is a farming thing. Take care of business. In other words, um, such wisdom produces prosperity, okay? Uh, take care of your flocks, your possessions. Take care of business. In other words, don't be a slaggard, but do your work. Like, look at it. You who are farmers, you know this, right? You should know the condition of your flocks. You should know if they're healthy or not. And be careful, careful pay attention to your herds, right? You were raised on a farm, weren't you? Okay. Uh, and riches do not endure forever. When the hay is removed, when you're out in the field and the new grass grows, then the lambs will provide for you. In other words, you got to what? Harvest the fields, right? And you got to take care of your aminals. Your animal, aminals, right? Were you guys raised on the farm? Anybody else raised on the farm? No? Wow. You were raised on the farm? Where? Yeah, where? Yes, you've told me this. Okay, Council Bluff. By the way, I taught, you know, forgive me for diversing, but um, the German immigration of the 1880s, when four million Germans came over, I just told somebody this, and a whole bunch of a millions of Germans also went to Venezuela, South America. And they left. You know why they left in the 1880s? Because the Western United States, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, they were all opening up after the Civil War, okay? And land was available. And they could come over here and get land, and they would own something. In Europe, they never owned anything because all the big landowners owned everything, and they, were, that was, uh, they, they just took care of the land for the big guys. And that's why, yeah, they were, they were, yeah, yeah, they were renters. And now they could come here and own their own fields. Anybody, anybody have that? We, my wife's family was that way. Your family too? Your family? Yeah. Yeah. Well, they came from Norway. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right, let's move on. Uh, wisdom, these verses addressed to the, oh, a shepherd, yeah. Maybe these verses were addressed to the king. The king should take care of his people. Let's go on to verse 28, chapter 28, I'm sorry. Uh, chapter 28 is uh, antithetic parallels, okay? The blessing and courage of wisdom. Wicked versus the righteous. I'm going to read verses 4 to 9. Where are we? Chapter 28. Those who forsake the law praise the wicked. Why aren't we doing that now? We're forsaking the law in America and we're praising the wicked. Yeah. But those who keep the law resist them, resist the wicked. Evil men do not understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it fully. Boy, we're watching that too, aren't we? In our, this is our culture, American culture. We have the right to kill unborn babies. Imagine that. Imagine that. I, I appreciate a woman's right to choose, but please then choose the life of the child to live. What did I just do? Choose the life of the child to live or use birth control, for heaven's sake. I don't know. Has it really? Wow. All right, where am I? Verse 6. Better a poor man whose walk is blameless than a rich man whose ways are perverse. He who keeps the law is a discerning son, but a companion of gluttons disgraces his father. He who increases his wealth by exorbitant interest amasses it for another who will be kind to the poor. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? If anyone turns a deaf ear to the law, even his prayers are detestable. Think about that, people. You turn a deaf ear to God's law, God's will, God's ways, and then you're going to pray. We got that in American Christianity. We've met so much of Christianity has just thrown away God's laws, God's ways. And then we're still praying to him. Oh, 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 oh. All right. Uh, let's go to verses 13 and 14. He who conceals his sins does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. This is what? Humility, right? A humble spirit. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, but he who hardens his heart falls into trouble. Okay, the wicked, the law, prayer, and repentance. I got another Spurgeon quote here. Covering our sins. In other words, making excuses. We make excuses. In other words, covering our sins. How do, we, how do we cover up our sins? I got a few ways. We make excuses, right? How about secrecy? We don't let anybody know. We lie. We avoid the responsibility for what we did wrong. Oh, was it my fault? I'm not. And, and then we also cover it up with tears, and confession leads to mercy. Okay? A way of dealing with sin is dealing with our tears and confession. And by the way, confession is first of all admitting, but then changing. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's go to verses 27 and 28. Sorry, we're not reading the whole thing. He who gives to the poor will lack nothing, but he who closes his eyes to them receives many curses. I may use that for my text. When the wicked rise to power, people go into hiding. <laughs> Woo. But when the wicked, what? Perish, the righteous thrive. All right, verse, uh, where are we here? Oh, well, yeah, verse 23. I wanted to go back to 23, I'm sorry. He who rebukes a man will in the end gain more favor than he who has flattering tongue. Correction or reprimand is highly regarded by wise people. All right, 
It's easy to listen to words that feed my ego. How do you know that? Where'd you get that? Yeah, it's easy to listen to words that feed my ego. You don't want to listen to somebody that is somewhat critical, right? All right, let's move on. Last, we're almost done, folks. Chapter 29 is the rulers, servants, and the fear. A wide range of topics in this. Verse 11, if you look at verse 11, let me get to chapter 29. A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. The need for what? Self-control, right? Self-control, that's a, that's a fleeting thing these days, doesn't it? Uh, verse 22. If a man, where is it? Verse 22. An angry man stirs up dissension. A hot-tempered one commits many sins. Hot-tempered. By the way, there are one, two, three, four, five, six verses here on correction in this chapter. Oh, verse, tw let's, well, all right, go to verse 18. Or did we do 18? No. Where there is no revel, oh yes, this is a good one. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. Where there is no vision or revelation, the people do whatever they want. There's another phrase, where there is no vision, the people perish. Okay? Visions in the Bible. Uh, it can be a prophet giving a message from God. Visions of things yet to come. By the way, that's very popular these days. Have you noticed that? In some, everybody's got a vision. Well, it's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be. A, and you know, it may be true, but I always think, well, this stuff was happening thousands of years ago. And we always try and time when Jesus is coming. By the way, you'll know. Okay? Just be ready. That's the thing. Um, we want to have, oh, <coughs> visions of what is our compelling future. All right? Uh, let's go to... All right, verse 27. And you should highlight this one. The righteous detest the dishonest. The wicked detest the upright. I have a note here that says, this has, oh, this has always been true. And it always will be. Those who seek to do what is right detest what is dishonest, and the wicked detest those who strive to do what is right. Correct? We got that war going on in America right now. Yep. All right. All right, let's stop there. We could do more. I wanted, last week I asked you to do some work on themes. Did anybody do any work on themes? No. I can tell. All right. So would you please, would you please, do a little work on theme. Pick a theme. You know, I, went, I don't have it with me right now. But one of the things I'm learning about Proverbs is Proverbs, if we listen, is self-reflective of our personality faults. Yes, I think it is. Like, nobody can tell me. Or I know it all. Or... You know, I'm smarter than you are, or something like that, or I'm easily offended. Another one. Those the and it's important, and by the way, I had that happen with someone. And that's the value of Proverbs. If Proverbs is a way of in point re, us reflecting on our own personality deficiencies. And here's the here's the news. Every one of them, every one of us has personality problems. I hate to tell you that, and I, I have to admit that also. We all have to admit that, and we don't want to hear that because, you know, you know. All right, next week's our last week, and we only have to do the uh, chapters, uh, what, 30 and 31, which will make life easy. Um, but then I want to kind of do a wrap-up, so... 
if you would prepare something, the value of Proverbs for your own life. All right? Anything else? What happened today? Oh, we had the gas people here today. They're working across the road, right, Mar? Who else was here? Oh, the uh, guys for the fire alarms, right? Oh, man, do they, I told them, well, you know, when they come, they make such noise because they have to run them. Oh, yeah, they have to run them, so it was just, anyway. Are they working, Em? We're good? Yeah. By the way, any of you, re oh, that's okay. So let's uh, close with a prayer and a blessing. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you this Wednesday morning, and dear Lord, we thank you for the gifts of life you give to us. And today, dear Lord, we thank you that we don't know everything that will come in the future. And that requires us to put our lives in, into your hands. And so, dear Lord, help us to plan the best we can, but also to realize that we really don't know what's coming. Be with our country, dear Lord. Be with our society, a society that to a great degree has thrown away um, following the law, your law, your will, your ways, and moving toward anarchy or disobedience. And dear Lord, your church as well, that has adopt, that is kicking out your will and your ways and doing that which is contrary to your will. Dear Lord, be with your church in America. Help us and help sections of your church to remain faithful to you, dear Jesus, to love you and honor you as Lord and Savior, but also to follow your will and your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Goodbye, everybody. Hasta la vista. Let me know when we're off, Allison.